Olá, começa agora o Campo Diplomático. O meu nome é Gabriel Estrela e hoje temos um programa especial para falar sobre o G20, um dos fóruns mais importantes econômicos globais que discute o fortalecimento da arquitetura e a governância para o enfrentamento de crises econômicas globais. Hoje eu recebo o Sherpa e representante do governo indiano no G20, Amitabh Kant. Mr. Kant, thank you very much for your presence here in our program at the AgriMice television channel. I'm truly delighted to be in your studio, and it's wonderful to be in Brazil. Well, uh, in the last uh, G20 meeting, uh, we had the establishment of the Global Biofuels Alignment uh, to an agenda that is important for both of our countries, amongst others, but mainly as two large sugar producers who are able to produce biofuels. What is the importance of this uh, agenda for India for the next coming years? I think it's a very, very important agenda, not merely for Brazil and India, but for the whole world to move towards biofuels. Brazil has done some really phenomenal work, really top class work. You've been able to use uh, sugarcane, uh, the waste of it, to be able to produce large amount of ethanol, take your uh, automobile manufacturing, modify it to be able to absorb ethanol to 100%. I mean, that's an outstanding work which Brazil has done. You hold lessons for the rest of the world. And therefore, India is now moving towards 20% ethanol. We move from about 1% to about 10%. We'll move to about 20%. And then we will try and work in very close partnership with Brazil to take it to higher levels. Uh, the engineering of some of these automobiles need to be modified. So we work in partnership with them. But Biofuel Alliance is in partnership with many other countries, including the United States of America, etc., on how biofuel can decarbonize the world. And that has been a very major initiative of India's G20 presidency. Mm -hmm. Well, this alignment, it provides a background for the uh, topic of energy transition yeah. that is being talked about in the G20, <coughs> was talked about in COP28 uh, in Dubai, and now we are facing new challenges and the upcoming uh, economies who are able to produce these biofuels, including also the United States, mainly with corn-based biofuels, are able to generate this, uh, this transition. Uh, what has India done? What examples can you give of energy transition in India? So uh, India produces about 185 gigawatt of renewable energy. We're the only country which achieved its NDC targets nine years ahead of schedule. We are the only country in the world amongst G20 countries in the top five of the Clean Climate Index. So India has done a lot and now it is pushing for green hydrogen. Uh, India is climatically blessed and therefore it uses renewables. It has brought down renewables to the lowest price points. It then uses renewables to crack water, produce green hydrogen. And India aims now to be an exporter of clean energy by about 2040s. We are right now importing about 200 billion worth of fossil fuel. We'll move away from this and become an exporter of clean energy that is for green hydrogen and its liquid form ammonia. And domestically, we'll use a lot of biofuel. It's not just sugarcane, it's a lot of uh, rice and wheat husk, which is burnt which pollutes the atmosphere. So we'll use all that. We'll also use corn to produce ethanol on a very large scale of 20%. But there's a lot of learning. There's a lot of partnership with Brazil on this. Mm -hmm. Well, this alignment, it also touches base on several key uh, other topics. Technology use, technology development, cooperation between the countries, as well as the use of other forms of fuel. India has one of the largest uh, uh, compounds of uh, uh, solar energy production as well. Uh, how has this experience changed uh, the, uh, um, the dependency of energy production from fossil fuels to renewable energy as well in India? So we are now one of the largest uh, producer of clean energy, renewable energy, solar energy. Uh, but it's important to understand that even if we produce 100% of our electricity through renewable, 100%, that's only 25% of our energy requirement. 
the balance 75 percent is all hard to abate sector where uh, you know you look at steel you look at cement you look at fertilizer you look at refinery uh, all these sectors you require right now imported fossil fuel gas is being used coal is being used so our challenge is to move away from gas which is imported move away from coal and produce green hydrogen and use green hydrogen to actually produce cement steel etc mm -hmm. and for transportation use biofuel the best way out is for two wheelers three wheelers four wheelers use biofuel even for long distance transport, use biofuels. But for steel, cement, refinery, fertilizer, you'll have to go for green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So how can we um, engage in this transition? One of the two groups, the two working groups of the G20 here in Brazil is the Sherpa track and the financial track, which includes also heads of the central banks, financial ministers of the 19 countries, along with the European Union and the African Union, who take part in this forum. Uh, much has been talked about how to finance this energy transition. What is India's view and what are its policy mechanisms in order to finance its own uh, energy transition and proposals for the world? So there are two key challenges. You know, the COVID has impacted lives of citizens. So the sustainable development goals have not progressed. Only 12% of the SDG goals are on target. So that's one challenge. You need finances for that. And then you have a challenge of climate action and climate finance because the World Bank and IMF were formed in the post-World War II period. That is the post Bretton Woods period. They were not designed for climate action. They are not designed for SDG goals. Mm -hmm. And therefore, one of the things we did during our presidency was to have an expert group on how do you re-modify the mandate of these institutions. And our belief is, that there's no shortage of funds in the world. There's $300 trillion available. $150 trillion available with sovereign wealth funds and with the private pension funds. We need to use that and ensure that these funds are de-risked when they are put into emerging markets. The important point to understand is that this year, 80% of the global growth is coming from emerging markets. According to IMF, in the next two decades, two thirds of the global growth will come from emerging markets. Now, if emerging markets are important, you need to accelerate the pace of SDG implementation. You need to accelerate the pace of climate action in this, and this would require large finances. So the expert group that we had constituted said that the total requirement would be in the region of about three trillion, about one trillion for SDG, two trillion for uh, climate action and the World Bank needs to modi modify its mandate to raise a lot of private funds instead of doing direct funding. The World Bank today raises only 0.6 cents to a dollar that it lends. It should be raising $10 to every cent that it lends. It needs to change its mandate to be a agency for raising private resources. And that would require World Bank to do blended finance. It would require it to do first loss guarantees. It would require World Bank to do credit enhancement. And these are new instruments for raising more resources from the private sector. So we're talking about the global framework, um, reimagining re this global framework in order to finance yeah. climate driven initiatives. Yeah. And also for the countries also to, to uh, spend more money also with these types of uh, programs, with these th types of investments for uh, there to be actual action in the short and medium long term. Uh, would this be a, a way of saying that um, these international institutions need to prioritize better uh, the finance for these climate driven actions? Well, the World Bank and IMF all need to redesign themselves they need to restructure themselves. They need to reformulate their programs for a new world. And that world is about climate action. They need to become climate financing institutions. They must become climate banks. They must become banks for sustainable development goals. They should not be just multilateral bank. The World Bank should now be a climate bank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how does this uh, 
intertwine with uh, the food agenda. We're talking also about uh, food security and India and Brazil, two, two countries that are very important economically as well for the G20. Uh, we have an important role in creating mechanisms to finance uh, food developments, food security in the region, as well as soil maintenance, many other uh, themes that impact not only food security, but energy transition, especially when talking about biofuels. Uh, That's a very important question. What is the challenge that, that we have to face in the next coming years in order for us to solidify this type of framework and solve the food security problem? You've asked a very, very important question. And I think Brazil provides solutions to many of the challenges of the world. And that is, how do you raise agriculture productivity? How do you do more value addition? Uh, farmers cannot live only on agriculture. You need to add greater value. So you need to bring in horticulture. You need to bring in floriculture. You need to bring in animal husbandry. You need to bring in fisheries. Agriculture must become multidisciplinary to raise farmers. One of the key challenges in India is that we have 40% of our population dependent on agriculture. And we are aiming to double our farmers' income, double our farmers' income. That can only happen if we work in partnership with Brazil to do more value addition. We are able to push for horticulture. We are able to push for bioenergy, use the waste of agriculture to convert into bioenergy. And we work in partnership with Brazil to do a huge amount of uh, cold storages, see that better produces provided to uh, the consumers. We are a large economy now. We are a $3.5 trillion economy. In the next three years, we'll be a $5 trillion economy. By 2030, we'll be a $10 trillion economy. And the speed at which India is growing is phenomenal. We are now growing at about 8%. 8% per annum means that we'll be a $10 trillion economy by 2031. And that would mean that your per capita income is going up very substantially. And all of them, all of them are looking for good agricultural produce and value addition in agriculture is critical. And we should help our farmers to raise their incomes through this. One of the ways that this can be done is by investing in uh, processing plants, obviously. But also it is important to invest in technology as well as digitization. Can uh, India, how can, uh, in, can India contribute to this agenda of digitization, technology development in order to finance these energy transition goals? So India has done a lot in terms of uh, technological leapfrogging. India's Every person, 1.4 billion people have a digital identity. We have, every Indian has a bank account. And we have now linked the bank account with both the digital identity and the mobile number. So 1 billion smartphones linked to the bank account. So we all do digital payment on our mobile. I have not been to a physical bank. I've not been to an ATM machine. I've not been, uh, I've not issued a check or I've not used a debit credit card in India for last four and a half years. I only use my mobile. My mobile is my bank. Mm -hmm. And for every Indian mobile is the bank. So we do 48% of the real time payments in the world in India, 48%. We do 11X of what USA and Europe do, we do 4x of what China does. And then we do cashless, paperless credit based on the history of consumers. All cashless, paperless. And stock markets have gone to tire two, tire three cities and rural areas, all on mobile. The digital identity, you can do a transaction in one minute. And now insurance, young startups, Young startups like GoDigit, Aco, all of them giving health, all insurance in one minute on your mobile, all on the go. So what India has achieved in the last eight years, according to the Bank of International Settlement, for digitization would have taken 50 years. So we technologically leapfrogged. 
and now our startups have got into agriculture in for providing inputs for doing value addition for taking agriculture produced from rural areas and providing to consumers living in tier 1 tier 2 cities so that you can get completely packed consumer products of very high quality in close to about 15 minutes at your doorstep now that is what the disruption in terms of technology has happened in india and we would like many brazilian agricultural entrepreneurs to come to india to see this experience this we would like our partnership with brazil to develop in the field of agriculture we would like more value addition from a, a brazil we would like this relationship between india and brazil to grow in the field of biofuels we would like india and brazil to grow its partnership in animal husbandry your productivity in of cows of cows and your cows at first come from india you know 40 years back you'd got the gheer cows from gujarat and now your productivity is more than what we get in india so we need to work in partnership with india and brazil it's a changed india it's a growing india it's a aspirational india because the average age of india is just 28 it's the youngest country in the world it will continue to grow and prosper and brazilians must realize that if they have to create wealth india is the place from where they can create wealth and how can you create wealth or we we could say poverty reduction uh, in the sense of going back to what you were saying about the, the cellular phones and the access that people have. I mean, we're talking about a different scale of population. More than 1 billion people in India have access to this digital identity, to uh, different types of banks, digital economy. How do you give access to a population uh, for these different types of mobile phones? How can you give access for them to have an opportunity for poverty reduction and engage in the economy more effectively. So let's, let me give you some examples. You know, uh, we put money into the bank accounts of 800 million people in India. 800 million people, money is being put straight into the bank account without any leakage and these are public funds these are public funds no leakage and during the covid period we did not give large package which led to inflation like in many other parts of europe and america we put money into the bank accounts without any leakage because we have digital identity we have bank accounts and what we are now doing is in 700 schemes of the government we put money directly into the bank accounts so that has led to a huge amount of productive efficiency in the economy and has benefited consumers. In India today, we give food to ensure that there's no hunger, there's no poverty. We provide food, ration, on a monthly basis to 800 million Indians. 800 million Indians. And that is why in India, we do not have hunger and poverty anymore. That's more than double Brazil's population. Yeah, that's double population. We do. That's what I'm telling you. Look at last eight years. India has made 40 million houses. 40 million houses means we have made more houses than the entire population of Australia. We have made 115 million toilets. That's like more than the population of Germany. And we have provided piped water connection, piped water connection to 253 million Indians. That's more than the population of Brazil. We have made 88,000 kilometers of roads, which is 88,000 kilometers of roads means four times the diameter of the earth. So the infrastructure has changed and transformed. And I want your viewers, all your viewers, to come to India as tourists, as businessmen, Come and explore India and enhance and develop this partnership between India and Brazil. Mr. Katz, you, you've given uh, many different examples of infrastructure development and how much India has growth. What is India's now agenda on addressing climate change with disaster risk prevention in the country, given all the change that the world is trying to um, maintain at least as possible, given um, the global you know, um, and the global becoming, the globe becoming 
you know, hotter, as well as the uh, oceans becoming more acidic. Um, what are the challenges that you face now and how are you financing also these types of prevention mechanisms in your country? So it's a very important question you've asked. It's important to understand that climate action is very critical because if we do not live up to this commitment of 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2050, we as human beings will not survive. The earth may survive. And therefore, during our G20 presidency, Green Development Pact became a critical driver. The Green Development Pact had many components. Tripling of renewable energy, doubling of energy efficiency, uh, biofuel alliance, green hydrogen, circular economy. But one of its major components was the disaster risk reduction. We formed a new working group on disaster risk reduction. And we feel that we have to prepare our citizens for the vast amount of climate change that will take place. In India is a very large country. It is bigger than 24 countries of Europe. We have, uh, you know, different kind of disaster crisis going on. Somewhere a flood, somewhere a, 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 a major climate change here. And therefore, we've created a very, very rapid action force for climate disaster risk reduction. And we believe that every infrastructure that is created must be based on climate action for the future. And therefore, technology will be critical. We also believe that net zero is net positive. And therefore, countries and companies must go green. They must go digital. Because if they do not go digital, they'll not go green. They'll never be a part of global value chain. And you'll be able to attract value. You'll be able to attract capital. The world in future will finance you if you are going green. The world in future will actually enable you to export if you are going green. And therefore, it's incumbent upon all our businesses to go green. It's incumbent upon all our businesses to go digital so that they can leapfrog. They can go ahead of all these developed countries. And that's why our leader, our prime minister, Mr. Modi, is pushing for going digital. He's pushing for going green in India. And we believe that we'll make a technological leapfrogging in, like we've done in digital world. We're far ahead of what the United States and Europe have achieved. We'll do the same in going green with new technologies and enabling our private sector enterprise to make a big jump forward. And what is India's proposal in order to um, have all the countries that take part and the global and the uh, economic groups to, that take part in the G20 to actually finance this type of transition? Is it to, to enhance public funds? Is it to tax the per high percentage of the most wealthy, as you know, uh, the, the finance minister of Brazil, Fernando Dodge, had proposed? Uh, what are the mechanisms that India proposes in order to achieve this type of financing? No, our view is that developing countries like Brazil and India are not responsible for carbonizing the world. 88% of the carbon space in the world has been occupied by developed countries. We occupy very little carbon space. India occupies only 1.5% of the carbon space, whereas on a per capita income basis, it is entitled to 17.5%. But irrespective of that, we believe that India must be the first country in the world to industrialize without carbonizing the world. We must lead the way for sustainable growth. And this would require both technology from developed world. It would require finance from multilateral agencies like World Bank. They must become climate banks to finance emerging markets like Brazil and India. So developing the world, decarbonizing at the same time, we need to also innovate a form of development that reduces th this type of uh, impact on the world, carbon positive impact on the world. And also change our lifestyle. So our prime minister says that we must all become pro-planet people. We must change our lifestyle. And lifestyle for environment is very important. So we run a program called The Life, where we say behavioral change is important. Let's not copy what Europeans have done. Let's not copy what Americans have done. You know, they switch on their lights, they switch on their taps. Uh, there's a lot of overconsumption. We need to modify our behavior, knowing fully well that the world must reach 1.5 degree by, by 2050. 
if we change, if we make behavioral change, we'll be able to bring down energy consumption by 21% will reduce greenhouse gas emission. Mm -hmm. Mr. Amitabh Kant, thank you so much for this interview. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to get to know more about India and the agenda in the G20 reunion that is happening in Brasilia. Uh, I'd like to uh, you know, extend my gratitude to you and to India for also participating always in, the, in this important program. Thank you so much. No, such a pleasure. I wish Brazil all the best for its G20. And I wish all of you, your channel, your viewers all the very best. And I look forward to welcoming them in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eu conversei com Amitabh Kant, representante e Sherpa do governo indiano no G20, uma das mais importantes reuniões sobre desenvolvimento econômico global. Eu convido você a acompanhar este programa, entre outros, no nosso canal YouTube, arroba Agromais TV. Eu fico por aqui e eu te aguardo no nosso próximo Campo Diplomático.